So now I would like to introduce today's speaker, um, John J.D. Klepfer. Uh, he attended Christopher Newport University, where he received a bachelor's in science in biology and a master's in science in environmental science. From 1990 to 2000, he was employed by the Virginia Living Museum as, a, as the curator of aquariums and herpetology. In 2000, he went to work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Grand Junction, Colorado as a wildlife biologist in their ecological services department. In 2005, he accepted the position as state herpetologist with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, DWR. His job duties with the DWR cover a wide variety of topics ranging from assisting law enforcement with wildlife tracking issues to conducting surveys and monitoring of species of greatest conservation needs in Virginia's wildlife action plan. <laughs> Since joining the department, he has also published over 20 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals, and his work has been featured in numerous newspapers and popular magazines. One of the more significant publications are A Guide to the Frogs and Toads of Virginia, A Guide to the Turtles of Virginia, and A Guide to the Snakes and Lizards of Virginia, and A Guide to the Salamanders of Virginia. So I'm sure everyone is excited, so I'm going to hand it over to him. Um, and like I said, if you want to put your questions in the chat throughout, feel free. Hey, well, thank you, Monica. I appreciate the opportunity again to uh, present at the Wildlife Festival. I think it's about the third or fourth time I've done this. Uh, I much prefer these to be in person, uh, but uh, it is what it is these days. Um, I'm uh, kind of getting over the tail end of a uh, sinus infection, so I'm going to turn my video off uh, so nobody will have to see me periodically maybe stop and have to blow my nose. Uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll have time at the end to answer any questions and stuff like that you might have. So. All right, um, with this presentation uh, for Rainbows and Rattles, um, I'm just gonna go over the uh, stakes of Southeastern Virginia. Uh, the area I've kind of uh, focused in on is Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, South Bay, and, and that extreme southeastern corner of the state. Uh, I'm going to talk about kind of a little bit generally about the different species found down there and uh, kind of and then go over a couple of uh, projects that we've had over the last 15 years of, uh, that we've uh, been involved with, uh, particularly with uh, rainbow snakes and uh, canebrake rattlesnakes. Uh, the area that we're going to be talking about in southeastern Virginia is part of the Atlantic Coastal Plain. Uh, the Atlantic Coastal Plain stretches basically from the Blight of New York down along the southeastern coast through the, through the Florida and then along the Gulf Coast and towards the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, it's subdivided into two uh, geographic features, the northern and southern uh, Atlantic Coastal Plain. And as you can see on the map on the right, Virginia Beach kind of lies in the southern part of the uh, Northern Atlantic Coastal Plain. Northern Atlantic Coastal Plain in Virginia, habitats are quite variable. Uh, they range from salt marshes to pine savannas uh, to uh, Tupelo gum swamps. And of course, there's a wide variety of wetlands uh, from sinkhole complexes, Carolina bays, or what some folks will affectionately refer to as whale wallers. And then uh, uh, we have uh, non-tidal freshwater wetlands. And uh, so there's a lot, a lot of different types of habitats within this particular area. And because of those variable habitats is why we have such a good diversity of wildlife in southeastern Virginia. So uh, you might not think about it, but uh, there are 24 species of snake uh, that are found in southeastern Virginia. Uh, they range from the diminutive eastern worm snake uh, to the timber rattlesnake, uh, locally referred to as the canebrake rattlesnake. And if you happen to have a copy of uh, a guide to the, to the uh, snakes and lizards of Virginia, 
Um, I'm going to kind of go through and discuss these snakes, uh, these species, as they kind of appear in the guide, so you can kind of follow along with the guide. Of course, I'll be skipping those sections that the uh, uh, that for those snake species of snakes that do not occur in southeastern Virginia. Okay, so the first few snakes I'm going to talk about, I refer to are what I call backyard snakes. Uh, these are snakes that are quite common in urban areas. They thrive in small patches of woodlands without much of a problem. They you know, probably don't disperse quite a bit, which, which makes them adaptable to uh, some of the, the heavy urbanization of that area. Uh, the eastern worm snake is the, uh, one of the smallest snakes in Virginia. Uh, it's an egg-laying snake. Um, you can quite commonly find these uh, on mature hardwood forested areas where flipping logs, where you can find them underneath a rotting log. Uh, these are egg laying snakes, and it's not uncommon to find these snakes uh, in communal nesting areas where you'll have females that'll uh, communally lay their eggs together. It's a wide ranging species, it's found all over the state almost. Um, but ironically, it's also probably one of the least studied snakes, uh, probably because it just isn't real flashy and it's very common. So it often gets overlooked, but it's definitely a snake that could uh, use a little bit of uh, natural history research. Now there's a couple of snakes that are closely related are the decays brown snake, also commonly referred to as a Northern brown snake, and then the red bellied snake. Um, the decays browns, now these are live bearing snakes. So they give live birth and uh, the decays brown snake will give live birth to approximately three to 26 live young, while the red bellied snake will give birth to about two to 12 live young. Um, what's interesting about the brown snake is that they're probably more common in urban areas. Uh, it's not uncommon and I have them myself in my cellar underneath my house here in Williamsburg. People find them quite commonly in mulch piles. Uh, you'll find them in log piles, and uh, but they thrive in urban areas, forested urban areas. Um, again, this pretty widespread snake, a fairly wide, widely uh, distributed across the Commonwealth, and the decays. Um, they have they're an interesting snake too, is that uh, they're fairly cold tolerant. Um, it's not uncommon to see them out in late fall on cool days, still basking maybe in a sunny spot in some leaves. So, and that's what's interesting about southeastern Virginia um, is that they, snakes and a lot of reptiles don't truly go into what's, what is referred to as brumation, which is reptilian and hibernation. The big difference between brumation and hibernation is that hibernation um, Animals tend to feed all the way up until they're ready to go in. And uh, brumation, uh, reptiles do not feed all the way up to the time they go in because if they're too cool, they cannot digest the food. Um, and so even in brumation, snakes will quite often pop out on a warm winter day. So when you start to get into these late winter days where you get to, into the upper 50s or even 60s for a few days at a time, it's not uncommon to see snakes pop out. The bright red belly of the red, of the bright red belly of the red-bellied snake uh, is believed to be used as a defensive mechanism. Uh, when threatened, uh, they'll kind of flip over a little bit their tail, and they'll they'll, they'll uh, flash this bright red tail. And the theory is that this kind of startles a uh, predator into thinking something's going on, and it may give them just enough time to try to escape. Another small urban snake that's found in a lot of mature hardwood forested areas are, of course, the ring-neck snakes. They're extremely abundant when you get up towards uh, the mountain areas, the northern ring-neck. We have two subspecies, the southern and the northern. Another snake that could use some genetic work to really define where the, what their true distribution is, because obviously you see some overlap here in the mapping of their distribution. The southern ring-neck snake is, uh, different in their, in their uh, description by having a slightly uh, incomplete band around the neck. Uh, as you see on the picture on the left, the band is not complete. And they also typically will have a row of black dots down their uh, belly. Now this northern ring neck snake has a complete band around the neck and has a, what they're referred to as an immaculate or clean belly. 
and this is a egg laying snake. Um, and most of all of these small snakes like this are primarily invertebrate eaters. Uh, they vary from anything from uh, spiders to grubs and to uh, other small inverts. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the rough and smooth earth snakes, another fairly common snake in this in southeastern Virginia. Uh, you can tell the difference between a rough and an earth smooth earth snake is that the rough earth snake has a very keeled scales. Uh, that means that if you were to rub your finger down the back of the snake, you kind of it feels kind of rough and bumpy a little bit. While the smooth earth snake, as this name indicates, if you were to run your finger down the back, the scales are not keeled and uh, they're very smooth feeling. Basically what a keel is, it's just a, a raised ridge in the middle of each scale. And uh, what purpose it has for each specific snake species that is keeled is not completely known. Uh, it could add to a little bit of the camouflage or it may add to its ability to hold on to prey by giving it some texture to grip. Interesting enough, uh, it was only recently, uh, probably less than 10 years ago, that the rougher snake was given its own genus, uh, Halde, uh, because it's considered a phyla, uh, phylotypic snake, polytypic snake, a polytypic snake, I'm sorry, tongue twister, uh, meaning that's derived from uh, multiple ancestry. The rough green snake, uh, this is a fairly common snake found throughout much of Virginia Beach and uh, Chesapeake and surrounding areas. You'll find them in brush, uh, you know, low, uh, low brushy areas. Um, you don't see them up in trees too much, um, but they do like heavy brush. They will go up into small trees. Um, interesting about this snake is when they die, um, they actually turn blue. And so sometimes I'll get people that'll send me photos of the dead snake and say, what is this blue snake I found in my driveway or in the road? And what it is is that when they die, the yellow pigment breaks down faster than the blue pigment. And as a result, you end up, I'm sorry, it breaks down faster than the blue pigment. So you end up with a blue looking snake because the green pigment is actually of a live snake. It's actually a combination of yellow and blue pigments. Again, this is a egg laying snake, quite arboreal, uh, but you will see them quite often, which is probably where you can see them more easily um, crossing dirt roads and stuff like that, where, where they kind of stand out a little bit more. Um, again, it's an insect eating snake primarily. They have an interesting behavior that uh, if you see one in the bushes, uh, they'll kind of sit there and kind of wiggle a little bit and kind of do this little dance a little bit. And what that is believed is a behavior to kind of mimic a tree, uh, uh, a branch or something kind of blowing in the wind and it adds to their camouflage as they move through the uh, brush. Uh, common, ribbon, common ribbon snake, uh, fairly broadly distributed uh, throughout Virginia. Uh, this is another snake that you can find up in the low hanging brush uh, and bushes and stuff like that. Uh, this is a live bearing snake. Um, they will give birth uh, to about a dozen uh, live young. Um, and uh, they're found throughout a lot of wetland areas. Uh, you'll find them around the Princess Anne area, particularly around our WMAs, uh, where you have uh, like a wet pond that's surrounded by a lot of heavy uh, brush. Um, it's closely related to the uh, Eastern garter snake, which is our state snake of Virginia. We have an official snake. Uh, the big differences between these two, which I'll back up here a little bit, the ribbon snake tends to be a little bit more slender. Uh, they have a much bolder uh, uh, striping on a more consistent black background, and they lack the uh, black stripes along the lower jaw that you'll see in um, uh, garter snakes. Garter snakes tend to be a little bit of a thicker bodied snake, not quite as a black background and not quite as a bold uh, striping either. Uh, a little bit of a ro more robust snake too. Um, again, this is another uh, live birth bearing snake. Uh, they'll give birth to about uh, sometimes up to 50 young. Um, this is a highly variable snake. 
I've seen this snake in very variable colors from reds and greens and even shades of blue. And there are several subspecies. Uh, it's probably one of the most widely distributed vertebrates in North America. They range all the way up into Canada and into Alaska. All these snakes up to this point that I've been talking about are all non-venomous, by the way. This, uh, the Northern Scarlet Snake, a fairly secretive snake. It's what we refer to as a fossorial snake. Uh, it spends much of its time underground. It, has, it looks a little bit like the Scarlet King Snake. <laughs> or a milk snake, but milk snakes are found in the eastern half of Virginia. And they have a little bit of an upturned snout. Uh, this upturned snout is, uh, helps them kind of plow through sandy soils looking for uh, eggs of lizards or lizards themselves. Not uncommon to see these in uh, pine savanna areas where you have a really sandy soil. Um, quite a beautiful snake. Um, but again, it is a secretive snake and it's a difficult snake to find. Uh, not, we don't know a lot about it here in Virginia. Uh, it has a very weird distribution. Uh, we have actually uh, this, uh, an observation all the way up into the mountains. And I asked uh, my um, uh, late Joe, Dr. Joe Mitchell uh, if this was an inaccurate uh, observation up in that county. And I believe, I forgot what county that was right there. Um, and he said, no, he said, but the theory is that that snake was properly identified by Richard Hoffman of the Natural History Museum. And the theory is, is because it was in the James River Valley that that specimen probably was a relic from a time when this species was more broadly distributed throughout Virginia. Scarlet king snake. Uh, this was an interesting snake. I'm not sure why I keep getting this line here on these pictures. I don't know where that's coming from. Weird. Um, anyway, this scarlet king snake, uh, we just recently described this snake, I think around 2007. For a long time, uh, scarlet king snakes were not considered here to be in Virginia. Uh, what it was was uh, the area of Virginia because scarlet king snakes further south, when you go down to Florida and Georgia, they tend to have very complete banding around their body. And so you, with the Scarlet King Snakes here in Virginia, you have a very incomplete banding. They kind of have a checkerboard belly quite often. And the theory was, was that, Scar that, there, that Virginia was just a big hybrid zone between Scarlet King Snakes and milk snakes. But through the power of genetics, uh, we actually demonstrated that, um, these snakes do, these are true scarlet king snakes. And the theory behind this is, is to why they have this incomplete banding around their body is because we don't have coral snakes in Virginia. And because we don't have coral snakes in Virginia, which is what is believed they are mimicking, um, they, uh, there is a lack of mimicry pressure. And so there is not a natural selection to be what, is, what I would call a pure looking mimic of a coral, of a coral snake. Eastern king snake, uh, by far my favorite snake, uh, dating all, I've loved these snakes since I was a little kid. Uh, this is a fantastic snake. Um, it's, a, it's very docile, you can pick them up. They may shake their tail a little bit, actually vibrate their tail. Um, but I am yet to have one ever actually bite me from picking it up in the field. Uh, it's a very powerful snake. Uh, gets up to about, big ones get up to almost four feet long. And they are notorious for uh, going, primarily feeding on other snakes, uh, particularly copperheads. Uh, they love some copperheads and they will go after a copperhead without any problem. They have a high level of, of uh, venom tolerance to their bite to the point where they're basically almost immune to them. And they're pretty widely distributed throughout uh, the eastern half of Virginia. We get this, and this is an egg laying snake as well. Now, the snake that probably everybody is one that's almost everyone is uh, familiar with, and that's the eastern rat snake, or uh, quite commonly referred to just as the plain old black snake. Uh, this is an egg laying snake. It's, found, it's quite adaptable to urban areas. Um, excellent climbers, always getting themselves into trouble with variable uh, different situations. Uh, whenever somebody calls me and says, 
they have uh, they found a snake shed in their attic or something like that. Uh, 99 times out of 100, it's a rat snake. Um, the juveniles, unfortunately, are quite often killed because people think they're baby copperheads or rattlesnakes uh, because they have a very uh, different pattern than from the adults. And, they, and like king snakes, they will too also vibrate the tip of their tail um, as, a, uh, as a defensive mechanism um, if they feel threatened. Mostly looking uh, to the eastern uh, rat snake is the uh, northern black racer. Um, northern black racer uh, has an interesting uh, scientific name, Kluber constrictor. Uh, I'm not sure how it got the name constrictor because the snake does not constrict. Um, it literally eats its prey alive. Uh, this is Virginia's fastest snake. And when I say fastest snake, uh, it's about a top speed of about four miles an hour, uh, which means that it can probably crawl about as fast as you would uh, at a very brisk uh, run walking pace, so to speak. Um, the juveniles too don't look anything like the adults. Uh, the juvenile on the bottom picture, you can tell the difference between rat snake and racer juveniles uh, juvenile racers, if you notice that they don't have a pattern in the lower third of their tail, uh, the pattern kind of disappears. They have a boxier uh, head and larger eyes. Large eyes on a snake is usually quite in, uh, indicative of a diurnal active predator, one that kind of visually looks for its prey, like a um, uh, rough green snake does. Um, back up here. Now you notice on the uh, juvenile rat snake, it has a pattern that goes all the way into the tail. And in the uh, racer, the pattern does not go all the way into the tail. As you see, its pattern was in the last third of the body. This is a very ill-tempered snake. Um, rat snakes, you can quite commonly pick them up and they may bite, may not bite. Um, racers are very snappy. Uh, they will bite, 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 bite. Um, and they give a good, good strong bite. Um, but like I said, typically when you come across one of these, they're just, uh, they're a bullet out of there and they're gone. Um, racers also too are well known for uh, eating other snakes. Um, and there's actually been video of uh, timber rattlesnake dens up in Pennsylvania where they've shown racers go into rattlesnake dens and actually eat the babies. During the, during the birthing season. Now here's one of the more interesting snakes in southeastern Virginia. One of the, quite often are called one of the clowns of the snake world. And these are the Eastern hognose snake. Unfortunately, their behavior, <coughs> their defensive behavior often gets them killed because people think they're uh, some kind of puff adder or something like that. Which is another common name for them. Uh, it's a highly variable snake. Uh, they come with this kind of almost what I call Halloween colors of black and orange to uh, yellows and grays uh, to what is called a melanistic form, and that's the all black form. Um, the one on the right, the orange one, that one was from up in the mountains. I haven't seen that particular color pattern in southeastern Virginia. Uh, what I've typically have seen in southeastern Virginia is kind of a grayish kind of dominant color pattern a little bit of yellows and stuff like that. Um, but they're found, uh, their favorite foods, they have that little upturned pig nose and they use that to plow through the soil and stuff like that, looking for their favorite food and that's toads. Uh, this too is also an egg laying snake as well. And here's the defensive mechanism. Uh, they'll first kind of hood up like, uh, here on the upper left, they'll kind of give that kind of cobra looking uh, hood pattern to them and they'll hiss quite loudly. And if that doesn't get you to back off, then they will go into a very theatrical death uh, feigning, which is probably one of the best in the, in the animal kingdom. And if you try to flip them over when they go into this death painting, 
um, they will just continuously keep flipping back over. Uh, they will, you can't roll them over when they're in this position. They just refuse to be rolled over. And, uh, and if, you got, if you sit back and wait a few minutes and you kind of look at them, you'll see them all of a sudden start to kind of look around and then they'll kind of slowly roll back over when they think things, their coast is clear and they'll just then try to crawl away. Um, this egg laying snake, quite harmless. Never had, even though they strike and hiss and put on a show, I've never had one actually bite. They do have some rear fangs, um, which are believed to use to puncture toads. Uh, when toads are being swallowed by them because they swallow their prey alive, um, toads will puff themselves up and the rear fangs are uh, believed to help puncture and deflate the toads so they're more easily swallowed. Um, mud snakes, very secretive snake. Uh, mostly comes out at night during uh, heavy rains, you'll find them. Uh, they live in the ditches and swamps uh, uh, around uh, southeastern Virginia. Uh, it's a large, a fairly large snake. Um, the juveniles on the upper right uh, have more red than black. Um, it's a beautiful snake, quite harmless. You can pick them right up. They won't bite or do anything. Uh, they're highly specialized in their diet. They eat exclusively almost on amphumas, which are a large uh, aquatic salamander that's found throughout southeastern Virginia. Um, the fellow here holding this snake uh, was one of our conservation officers who lived up on the Chickahominy. <coughs> and he found this thing burrowing uh, through his driveway. And uh, he saw a tail sticking up in his driveway and he wasn't sure what it was. So he decided to dig out whatever it was in his driveway. And it had this big female. Uh, it's not uncommon for these females to go burrowing around in the upland areas when they're getting ready to nest. Oh, wow, what a beautiful snake. He had no idea what it was that he found. <laughs> he was kind of dumbfounded about it, but he's a he's kind of a snake guy, so he kind of enjoyed it. Another one of the Ferrancia uh, is the common rainbow snake. Uh, by the way, Ferrancia has is one of, um, has no meaning. Nobody knows what the word Ferrancia means. Uh, it's believed that an English naturalist kind of created it as a joke, and it's always stuck ever since. Um, the rainbow snake, uh, probably one of my favorite snakes, too. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous snake. It lives up to its name, has this rainbow pattern on it um, of various colors, uh, everything kind of like a bubblegum pink <coughs> to these redder uh, uh, dorsal stripes. Uh, this is another highly specialized snake. Um, in the sense that uh, it eats almost uh, exclusively American eels. Um, this uh, snake is actually, we can find, you can, uh, is very secretive, um, but is also known to burrow quite a bit. And they have been uncovered as far as deep as almost 10 feet in sandy soils. Um, and uh, you can find them quite common, not real common, but around the Back Bay area. Um, in early spring, uh, basking along the edges. Uh, but once the water temperatures come up towards late May and June, it become very difficult to find. Uh, the Eastern Glossy Swamp Snake. Uh, this snake actually originally was only known from one location. Virginia is the extreme northern end of its range. Um, it's kind of a disjunct population. Uh, there was only one known, uh, a couple of observations at one known location that was at the mouth of the Dioscan Creek where, where it uh, uh, confluence with the Chickahominy River. Uh, however, uh, a couple of years ago, a, uh, a, a local snake enthusiast uh, found a road killed sample uh, down around the Creeds area uh, near uh, the extreme southeast Mackey Island refuge area. And so we have another observation down there now. Uh, it gets its name from the uh, uh, glossy swamp snake. It used to be called the crayfish snake. 
uh, but they changed the common name um, because it's uh, received its other common name, crayfish snake, uh, from its diet of li liking to eat uh, freshly molted crayfish as its favorite food. Uh, we'll go into the water snakes now. Uh, the water snakes, these are all live bearing snakes. Uh, they give live birth. Uh, the plain bellied water snake uh, was previously called the red bellied water snake for obvious reasons. Uh, it has a very orange red belly. It's a very terrestrial water snake, probably what, the most terrestrial of all the water snakes we have. Uh, I've seen these guys quite some distance from water. Um, and they're quite arboreal too. Uh, I've seen them as high as up 30 feet up in a tree overhanging streams and stuff like that. As you can see in that lower left picture, uh, it's one of my field techs, Dane Conley, and he had a water, this red belly water snake hanging in a bush over his head about seven feet over the water. Um, what's interesting about it is a lot of fishermen kind of tell tales of uh, cotton mouths or water moccasins falling into their boats when they're fishing along the edges of the streams and they bump into a bush. And probably 99 plus percent of those snakes are never cotton mouths. Cotton mouths are a very heavy bodied snake, seldom climb up more than just a few feet up into a bush or something. What they're typically seeing drop out of trees and into their uh, boats are probably plain belly water snakes. It's a very common occurrence for them to have for that to happen. <coughs> They're good, excellent climbers. Brown water snake, another uh, arboreal snake too, as well. Climb up in bushes and logs and stuff overhanging water. This is Virginia's largest uh, water snake. Uh, this is a catfish specialist. Uh, it specializes in eating catfish. Um, and the females are notably larger than, uh, than the males. Um, they're quite curious snakes. Um, I was actually getting ready to do some scuba diving down the Nottaway uh, to help our uh, mussel guy collect some uh, mussels down there one spring. And we were getting ready to go do some diving. He turned around and this big female brown water snake literally just swam right up to me because I was, you know, splashing around in the water a little bit, it probably thought that this was, a, I was a fish in distress and thought he was going to get, she was going to get an easy meal. She swam right up to me. I picked her up, took a couple photos with her and uh, let her go. Um, males are quite, are significantly smaller than the females. Um, if you go down to Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge and you walk that boardwalk in early spring, um, it's not uncommon to see females with multiple males um, piled up on top of her. Uh, it's, it's one of the behaviors they have is referred to as a mating ball. Uh, we get multiple males trying to mate the same female. Uh, one advantage of that is it's a lot of genetic diversity in her offspring. They have a very unusual head shape too. Uh, they're kind of a, a pointy snout to some extent and their eyes kind of a little bit more on top of their head. Uh, so they're almost, I call them, they almost have an anaconda kind of look to their head. By far the most widely distributed and most common of the water snakes is the northern water snake. This is the snake that uh, people uh, unfortunately kill, uh, claiming that it's a quote unquote water moccasin or cotton mouth, um, because they do look a little bit similar to a cotton mouth. Widely distributed snake found in almost any type of permanent wetland, whether it's an isolated pond, lake, reservoir, stream, whatever, uh, any kind of permanent body of water in Virginia is guaranteed to have uh, uh, northern water snakes living in them. All right, now I'll move on to the, uh, the venomous snakes. Um, so our first one here is going to be uh, probably one that uh, folks are most familiar with down in southeast Virginia, particularly Virginia Beach, and that is the northern cottonmouth. Um, contrary to popular belief, uh, these snakes do not chase people. Um, they have a top speed of about two miles an hour. Uh, you could walk backward, moonwalk faster than these snakes to chase you. Uh, they get a bad reputation because like other water, like other water type water, water snakes, I should say, 
Um, they will swim up to boats and they will swim up to things in the water because they think it's a log or something else. And, it's, and I've known fishermen and I've seen it happen myself. And they will try to crawl into the boat because they don't know better. They just think it's a log or something on the water for them to get out on. Um, they are quite curious. Um, they're excellent. They're, they eat a wide variety of things from frogs to fish to other snakes, but they're probably most famous for scavenging. They'll eat a lot of dead stuff. Um, they do a lot of scavenging. <laughs> to get one to bite, you literally would have to really step on it or have to grab it or get it really harassed. I've been around dozens and dozens and dozens of these snakes and simply just kind of either push them out of the way um, or just walk right past them. And they may do the mouth gaping where you'll see the white interior of their mouth. Um, but it's all show and no go. Uh, they're a very unaggressive snake, um, but they are a very curious snake. Uh, as you can see, the difference between the uh, northern cottonmouth and northern water snake, northern cottonmouth tends to have a more angular uh, head shape to it to the northern water snake. Uh, all of Virginia's venomous snakes are live bears. They're all pit vipers as well, meaning that they have a pit organ just behind the nostrils that can uh, detect uh, heat signatures. Now, all of our uh, pit vipers in Virginia uh, have what is called a male-to-male uh, -male combat for mating rights, but this, but it's most commonly seen in cotton mouths. Uh, you'll get males that uh, that will uh, fight over uh, mating rights in a particular area. And uh, what it is is that it's basically a wrestling match. There's no biting involved. Obviously, biting each other wouldn't be very effective for the species. You'd be killing each other off. Um, what it is is just a matter of who's bigger and who's stronger. And the male, would, one male eventually, will, the larger male will eventually push the smaller male down and just basically uh, chase them off a little bit. Now, the... Uh, most widely distributed uh, venomous snake or pit viper in Virginia is the is the copperhead. <laughs> Found throughout the state, including the eastern shore. Quite adaptable to a large variety of habitats, wetlands, mountains, all over the place. They do quite well in urban areas as well, where you have large tracts of forested uh, habitat. Uh, we have them here in Williamsburg. Uh, had a couple of them show up in my backyard uh, uh, on occasion. Um, uh, it's a uh, it's not an aggressive snake. It is by far the most attributed to snake bites. We probably have over a hundred bites uh, that are reported to the Department of Health every year. Um, it's the least toxic or least lethal of any of the snakes. Uh, Probably about one person every 10 years or so may die from this bite. And it's usually somebody who may have uh, an, an elderly person that may have a, uh, a underlying health issues or something. Um, but bites typically happen in the spring or when folks are kind of getting out and doing some mulching and gardening and they are excellent at camouflage. If they're sitting in the leaves you will not see them unless if you are looking for them. And even then they can be difficult to spot. So folks quite commonly will get bit on the hand when they're kind of spreading leaves or uh, mulch out. If, especially if that stuff has been sitting there for an extended period of time and the copper has maybe hibernating in it or taking up residency in it. Um, I tell folks that, uh, you know, that's one of the, if you don't want to get rid of copper heads, you don't want them in your backyard and they're known to be in your area, just eliminate any of that type of habitat brush, mulch piles, stuff like that. And just be cognizant of where you're putting your hands and when you're you know, picking up logs or moving a log pile. Another problem is too, is that uh, folks sometimes get bit on the foot uh, when they walk out at night to their car on a late summer evening and they accidentally step on one. That, this is when they're most active is right after sunset, particularly on those warm uh, summer nights after a rain. Because uh, they come out and they'll be hunting frogs and stuff like that. So if you got to go out and walk your dog at night, um, be sure to take a flashlight with you and just watch where you're walking. Uh, the timber rattlesnake, 
uh, locally referred to as the cane brake rattlesnake. Uh, the distribution is uh, timbers are up in the mountains and the cane brakes are here in the coastal plain. Uh, they are the same snake. It's just a geographic variation of the timber rattlesnake or the mountain populations. There's some differences ecologically between the two populations. Uh, in the southeastern part of the state, <coughs> excuse me, they get much larger than they do up in the mountains. Largest one in southeastern Virginia recorded was about six feet long. Um, they don't communally uh, hibernate together. There'll be, be like one or two snakes underneath a rotting log or something in a stump or a hummock. Um, there's some differences in the scale pattern count, uh, but genetically they are the same snake. This is a state endangered species. Uh, we've lost a ton of habitat uh, due to development throughout southeastern Virginia. Uh, the photo on the left uh, was actually taken up on the peninsula a few years ago. It's a large male. Males get uh, are uh, much larger than the females. Um, interesting enough about them, uh, in the coastal plain, adults primarily eat gray squirrels. Um, they may eat up to about five, five meals a year, but they only average about one and a half meals a year and they can go up to two years without actually eating. Uh, we've had snakes successfully survive that have never gotten any meals of when we were doing radio tracking on these animals. Uh, the posturing that you're seeing with this particular snake against the base of this tree is referred to as vertical ambushing. Basically, that snake is just waiting for a Mr. Fuzzy Tail to come back down the tree, and uh, then that'll be the end of that squirrel. Uh, during the mating season, uh, the top left photo is an example of what's referred to as mate guarding. Um, females uh, will be receptive to mating after their spring shed. And up until that point, they will be receptive to mating. Uh, so it's not uncommon to find males uh, actually guarding a female. Now that big male that's curled up there, if you look at the bottom there, that bottom coil is a female, it's another snake. He's literally coiled up and sitting on top of her. Um, it's not uncommon during this time of the year that you'll have the one dominant male that will be guarding the female, waiting for her to shed and be receptive for mating and have satellite males sitting around. That's where the combat comes in. Uh, the courting process um, goes through and then the female, uh, there will mate. Uh, mating season starts in mid-July and runs through early September. Uh, the males will uh, mate with the females. Uh, the sperm will remain in the oviducts, will remain uh, dormant, so to speak. And then they will become impregnated the following spring. And then they will give birth the following uh, late summer, early fall. Uh, there's actually some uh, parental care. The females will stay with the newborns. Uh, for about a week until they shed, get their first shed. And once the, uh, the, uh, the newborns get their first shed, uh, then they all disperse into the surrounding uh, landscape as well as the female. Uh, I refer to this called hibernation, but it's not a true hibernation. Uh, it should be more of a referred to as less brumation or I will call it reptilian hibernation. Uh, they usually solitarily hibernate under tree hummocks or old stumps. And this is this photo I took with a uh, uh, a camera, a, a snake eye camera, actually dropped down into this tunnel. And this was only about a foot below ground in, in a, in a uh, stump cavity. And the snake was obviously alert, as you can see the tongue sticking out. This was uh, mid-January. So we did all of this radio telemetry. Uh, we had one of the largest was went on for several years. Uh, it was a 17 year project we did on this snake. They lived about 25 years. Uh, we tracked over 53 individual snakes, had 14,000 observations of these 53 snakes. Uh, we implant them with a, with a radio tracking device. Uh, we use isofluorine on the top left photo shows us tubing the snake and uh, putting isofluorine in the tube to knock them down. <clears throat> What's interesting is these snakes can actually hold their breath. Once they get a whiff of that isofluorine, it's not uncommon for them to hold their breath for 30, 40 minutes until they finally kind of go down. Surgery usually goes fairly easily, stitch them back up, and they're released back out the next day.
So with this work, what we found out um, was that males have the largest home ranges of all. The uh, uh, fe non-gravid females uh, have the second largest home ranges. And of course, gravid females or pregnant females have the smallest. They typically do not move around a lot. Now, this is a typical mating, um, mating search pattern for a male uh, canebrake rattlesnake. Um, if you look around, here's up in June, uh, up here on the upper right around June, and then you get, get into mid-July. And then towards the end of July, toward around July 23rd, the top of this pattern, all of a sudden you see the snake take off. And then it moves over to the left and runs all the way down through July 29th, July 30th, July 31. And this is all this movement pattern going on. And this is called a mate searching pattern. And then eventually towards what it looks like, we believe around towards mid-August, he catches up with a female and ends up kind of just chasing her around for a little while. Unfortunately, during this wide ranging mate searching pattern um, is when the uh, snakes get themselves into trouble. Uh, they'll crawl into neighborhoods. Um, and that's when we start to get the phone calls uh, from like, you know, late July through early September of uh, so on called quote unquote nuisance snakes. Uh, this was a series, <laughs> this was actually, I think last year this was a 48 hour period where we had multiple snakes being observed uh, throughout the area. Uh, typically we tell folks, please leave them alone or uh, at the very least just give us a call and we'll try to get out there and get them moved out of the way. Fortunately, this is quite common that they end up getting killed, ran over or uh, other things happen. Another project that we have going on down in the Back Bay area, uh, we're investigating the prevalence of snake fungal disease. Uh, it's an, been an emerging snake disease throughout the country over the past 10 years. People do more and more research with it. This came uh, out of uh, observations of several dead rainbow snakes that were just being found randomly lying dead on the bank of uh, areas around Back Bay. <laughs> now, what was interesting was to find a randomly dead snake in the woods or anywhere is extraordinarily rare. To find randomly dead rainbow snakes, that is exponentially rare uh, because rainbows are just rare to begin with. So we're not sure what was going on down there. So we started uh, working with uh, some folks. This is um, this this these photos right here actually are of a red-bellied water snake who has extreme case of uh, snake fungal disease, a lot of crusting, a lot of open ulcerations. Uh, I doubt this snake probably lived more than another 24, 48 hours. And with rainbow snakes, what we have seen, the snake, rainbow snake on the left is a very healthy, very typical looking good collars, no sores, no nothing, what I call a clean looking snake. Now, unfortunately, here on the right is a rainbow snake that is heavily infected with snake fungal disease, all of these little ulcers along its belly. Uh, a lot of crusting around the face and nasal areas. Uh, this snake was actually having to uh, mouth gape in order to breathe because it's uh, the crusting over its nose. It couldn't breathe through its nose, kind of like me right now. Um, uh, but it's uh, pretty sad to see. Um, and we've noticed, and this has only been something we've noticed in this particular area. We have not seen reports of snake fungal to this extent with rainbow snakes anywhere in the country. So as such, we started doing a lot of sampling, uh, working with state parks, and uh, we got hooked up with uh, some folks out of Virginia Tech. Uh, the top photo, so it's Dr. Joseph uh, Hoyt from Virginia Tech, uh, Gail Blandvillen, uh, who's a postdoctoral student at Virginia Tech, Eric Moline from state parks, and then myself, and then Dane Conley, uh, who started off on the, doing a lot of the sampling uh, when he was a field tech, uh, field technician with DWR, and who's now a graduate student continuing this research at Virginia Tech. And he has expanded this research investigation with rainbows throughout uh, their range in Southeastern United States. So, so what can you do to help with snake conservation? Uh, you can support efforts by establishing protecting natural areas, you can educate yourself and others about snakes, provide backyard habitat for snakes such as brush piles, stuff like that. 
Uh, avoid using glue traps and nylon erosion control mats. I wish they would just ban nylon erosion control mats. It is completely false that this stuff will decompose and go away because only way that it decomposes if it remains in direct sunlight, but it eventually, it does what it does and it allows for the grass to grow up. And this erosion control matting can be there for a decade after it's used. And it will continue to kill animals throughout that time period, whether if it's, I've seen frogs entangled in it, snakes entangled, there's even been observations of turtles getting entangled as well as birds. Please do not use nylon erosion control mats for anything whatsoever. Choose other options such as core fiber matting or any other coconut fiber matting that you might want to use for erosion control. Glue traps, stop using glue traps, please. They are just indiscriminate killers. They will kill anything that gets on there from birds to snakes to lizards or anything else. And ultimately, the best way that most folks can do to protect snakes is just leave them alone. If you just kind of observe them and let them go about their business, they'll crawl off and move on. Why should we really care about snakes? Um, they're ecologically important as both predators and prey. <coughs> they control rodent populations, which helps them control human disease issues. One single rattlesnake has been shown to remove up to 2,500 ticks a year from just inadvertently the diet that they uh, eat uh, from their diet. Uh, there's fascinating creatures, and they just simply deserve our respect. And uh, let's face it, they're just pretty cool animals to begin with. Um, we have a lot of resources for reptiles and amphibians, as Monica mentioned in my bio. Um, these, all these guys are available on DWR's uh, website. Uh, we actually are getting ready to publish here in another month or two uh, got a second edition of a guide to the turtles of Virginia. Um, but these are hugely popular field guides, and uh, they were, uh, they're, they're, they're targeting an audience, what I call 8 to 80. Uh, anybody can pick them up. Lots of great, cool photographs. But ultimately, in the end, snakes are first cowards, then bluffers, and last of all, warriors. And well, that was a, probably the best way to summarize a snake. And with that, I uh, will close this up. And if there's any questions or anything, I'll be more than happy to uh, take on anything. And I'm still trying to figure out what that blue line is in the screen. I was trying to figure that out as well. Thank you for the presentation. I um, am not 100% sure, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know where that <laughs> blue line came from. I know. <laughs> Um, so there were a couple questions. Um, do you see the chat or do you want me to um, read them to you? Uh, let me see here. Uh, yeah, go ahead and read them to me. Uh, yeah. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> so this one says, it's inter interesting that the scarlet snakes spend so much time underground. Yes, it's so brightly colored. Any theories about why um, it would involve with so much color, even though, sorry, I'm scrolling. <laughs> even though underground it would serve no purpose? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I've always kind of thought that too with a lot of these very secretive snakes like, like a rainbow snake. Why is rainbow snake so brightly colored? It lives in black water and it stays hidden all the time. Um, with the scarlet snake and the scarlet king snake, scarlet snakes, uh, which I, I should have probably mentioned as well, uh, they're also two uh, coral snake mimics is what they're believed to be. Um, maybe not quite as good. There's a lot of mimicry. But there's also some other theories and discussions uh, that perhaps with these banded ant banded snakes that when they're on the move and moving, those bands tend to kind of uh, distract a mammalian predator's eye. So there's a lot of work still going on with exactly what purpose these colors have. Bright reds in anything in nature, bright red animals tend to be warning colors. Anything that's bright red Guaranteed, try, don't touch it. Uh, and, the, and the best example of that is a velvet ant. Uh, as beautiful as velvet ants are, they're actually a little wingless wasp and they will sting the bejeebas out of you. Um, so anything brightly colored, particularly red, is usually a warning. So maybe they're kind of, it's kind of a mimicry of a warning. Um, for instance, another good example is uh, 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 red salamanders. 
bright red, red salamanders. They live under logs their whole lives, but they are believed to be mimicking the red F stage of the red spotted newt, which is actually a toxic stage of the newt. Um, so there's usually a mimicry issue going on there of something if they are not toxic in some way themselves. Awesome. And then um, I have this one sent directly to me, so you won't be able to see it. So it says that your knowledge of stakes is so impressive. Is there a place or is there a place we can take a course that focuses on snakes or is the study of snakes just something you learn um, from the school of life? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure there's any courses outside of academia. Um, yeah, you'd probably have to enroll in school or something. Uh, a great organization to get involved with, if you really want to learn more about snakes, get involved with the Virginia Herpetological Society. I should have thrown their website up there. Uh, but the Virginia Herpetological Society is basically made up of a body of uh, uh, professionals and uh, snake enthusiasts and amateurs. And they have a lot of, uh, they have multiple uh, outing events where they go and do surveys at various locations around the state. Um, and they have a great group of people that are very passionate about snake conservation and reptile and amphibian conservation in general. So I would, I would highly recommend if you're just kind of the average person wanting to learn more about snakes and get involved with this stuff, um, look at joining the Virginia Herpetological Society. Great group of people. Awesome. And then let's see. Okay. I'm a horrible reader, so I'm trying my best. <laughs> so during the mating ball of the brown water snake, what are or are the offspring of female able to be seared by multiple males or is only one male able to actually fertilize the eggs? Uh, it's multiple. Um, yeah, it's, it's male, she'll, she'll mate with multiple males, and uh, it's not unusual to have uh, a, a litter that is sired by multiple different males. Uh, again, it goes back to it's, it's advantageous because it creates a lot of genetic diversity within your litter. Sweet. Okay, keep going. Okay, this one says, wow. What a great presentation. Thank you. Where can we obtain slash order the herp field guides that you pictured? Uh, you can order them on our <laughs> website. Uh, I think it's just called shopdwr.com. Uh, I believe is what it is. Um, but yeah, you can just go to our website and go to our online gift shop and you can buy the guides individually or you can buy them in, uh, or you can save a few dollars and actually buy them bundled. Awesome. And then I guess the blue line I was supposed to clear. I don't, I still don't know 100% where it came from, but I'll look into that one for my next. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> and then I think that's it. She, someone said, great presentation. I'm glad you included a state map of the dis, like distribution. Um, she's in Paul. Pottawanton County, P-O-W agent. Okay. Sorry, I'm from Michigan. I've only lived here a couple <laughs> of years, so I don't know all that yet. But anyways, it was nice to be able to see where um, they're found in the country. Yeah, and uh, distributions within uh, those counties themselves are not always contiguous throughout the counties uh, because a lot of these snakes are very much habitat specialists, so they may have a very limited range, but then stuff like rat snakes and racers and garter snakes may have a much broader uh, distribution within, within those counties. Awesome. And then this person said, I like to study snakes um, in academia. Actually, what schools um, should she look at? <laughs> uh, there's some very notable uh, uh, schools uh, for snakes. Um, for herpetology, generally, there's the University of Kansas, Florida, uh, you know, almost uh, Auburn. Auburn has a huge herpetology, very reputable herpetology department. Um, California, uh, Arizona, usually the states that have a lot of biodiversity, a lot of diversity of reptiles and amphibians are, usually have a program at one of their larger institutions. But, um, and usually those are found in the Southwest or the Southeast part of the country. But there are some uh, Midwest and some Northeast programs as well. Yeah, so there's lots of them out there. 
Awesome. And then that looks like the last question. There's lots of people in there if you want to look eventually saying like suburb presentation and all that kind of stuff. But are there any other questions um, before we close the session? I just want uh, I just want to say thank you and I appreciate all the kind comments. Um, it's a lot to cover, and I, you know, I didn't cover it all. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I, you know, I'll, I'll obviously walk away from this and go, "Oh, I should have mentioned that." Oh, I should have mentioned. That. But uh, it is what it is. You know, I don't have all day just to talk about snakes. <laughs> Awesome. Well, like I said at the beginning, um, thank you everyone who came to the session. We are going to email out um, a link to this Zoom meeting um, with the snowstorm and things going a little crazy with the festival, hopefully by the end of the weekend. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, and I uh, hope everybody uh, hunkers down and enjoys the snow here over the next day or two.